Hi guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome to the Introduction to Rust tutorial series. This will be video seven. Now before I get into what the topics are going to be for this video, I just wanted to mention that the next video will be a project video. The reason I'm going to do a project for the next video is because the channel just hit 1,500 subscribers and I thought I should do something to celebrate it at least. Anyway, in this video we're going to talk about vectors, we're going to talk about hash maps. We're also going to talk about two specific match statements, one called if let and the other one called if when. And we're going to talk about casting. And finally, we're going to talk about the result enum. So we've looked at vectors before, at least we've used them in some of the other tutorials. So you can see here, we're using this macro here to create a vector. So what exactly are vectors? Well, vectors are like resizable arrays. Like slices, their size is not known at compile time, but they can grow and shrink at any time. A vector is represented by three different uh, pieces of data. A pointer to the data, its length, and its capacity. The capacity itself indicates how much memory is reserved for the vector, and the vector can grow as long as the length is smaller than the capacity. When this threshold needs to be surpassed, the vector is then reallocated with a larger capacity. And we'll actually take a look at that here in a moment. So we can also create a vector using the vect new method. As you can see here, uh, we're calling the namespace vect, and then we're saying new. And this is a mutable vector. This method here, push, allows us to put a new value into our vector v. And then we're using a for loop to iterate through our reference to v and then print out each of the values. Now keep in mind that vectors can only have one type of value inside of them. So running this program shows us that we have five, six, seven, and eight inside of our vector. We can also debug print out the vector itself. So I'm calling a reference to our vector here. We can print out the length by calling uh, vector.length here. And then we can print out the capacity as well by calling v.capacity. Here's our vector and we have a length of four and a capacity of four. Now if I take and push another value into our vector, what will our capacity become? As you can see here, now our length is five and our capacity becomes eight. So essentially what will happen is once we pass eight, then it'll go up to 16. And then once we pass 16, it'll go up to 32 and so on and so forth. So we can also use a method called pop and this will pop the last value out of our vector. You can see here that the result of that method actually gives us a option value. So it says sum 10 and we can destruct that to get the 10 out of it. So to annotate vectors, you put vect and then you put triangle brackets around the type annotation of the thing that you want to put inside your vector. So in this case, we want to put I32s inside. And because this is empty, it should give us none instead of a sum. We get back an empty vector with zero length and zero capacity, and then we get back none as our answer for the uh, pop method. So we can also embed an enum inside of a vector. So despite a vector only allowing us to have one single type, because an enum technically is a single type, in this case, our example enum. So example is a single type, despite the fact that it has three different variations. And as far as the uh, vector is concerned, these three different variations do, are not enough of a difference to actually cause the vector to error out. As you can see here, we can print it out. If we derive the debug, we get our enum types back here, which is int, float, and text, each one with a different type inside of it. So this one has a integer, this one has a float, and this one has a string inside of it. So this type of behavior can be pretty useful for various different programs. All right, so now let's talk about hash maps. I have to make an import to gain access to the hash map. This is because it's not technically part of the standard library, at least not natively, like vectors and arrays and so on and so forth. The type hash map stores a mapping of keys mapped to a value. This does this via a hashing function, which determines how it places these keys and values into memory. Many different programming languages, of course, have their own types of hash maps. For instance, Python has dictionaries. There are other names for it, like associative arrays. As you can see from our example here, we create a mutable hash map, and then we can use the method insert to insert. What we're doing is we're saying string, comma, and then an integer. So our key will be of type string, and then our value will be of type integer. Now, like with vectors, 
these need to be consistent types. So for instance, if I put a float in here instead of an integer, we'll get an error and it'll say it mismatched types. Or we can also use this for loop here to iterate through our hash map. Our hash map has random 12 and then strings 49 inside of it. Now we can use this get function to gain access to an element inside of a hash map. We're also going to use a match statement here because the actual return statement of this get method is an option. So if we match on hm.get and say we're looking for a string and we want to get the actual 12 outside of it, then we need to destruct it by using the match statement and then we can just say, okay, well if it has a value uh, connected to the key, then return that value and print it out. We get 12 out of the hash map. We can also use a method called remove to actually remove not only the key but the value. The key is associated with the value, so if we just remove the key, it will in fact remove the value as well. And in fact, I'm going to move this up above here, and you'll see that we will only have one single field inside of our hash map. We only have our random field in here. If we call a key that doesn't exist inside our hash map as well, uh, it will return a none with the get method. So in this case, it would match with this and it would say no match. That in fact does happen. All right, so consider this statement here. We have a value s, which has sum and then a character inside of it. And if we want to get to that character, we have to write an entire match block. So this can be a bit unwieldy. That's why we have the if let binding. If we say if let, and then we put sum i, so this is the actual branch itself here, and then we set that equal to s, so this is kind of like destructuring. We're basically saying this pattern must equal this pattern, uh, where i is c, and, and then the sum part is the uh, outer shell of that. We have our actual result here, so the code that we want to run inside of here, and then the other branch we can put inside of an optional else clause. So this entire else clause can be removed if we want to. You can see here that if we run it, we get C back from both of these. The one downside of using a if let binding is that it's not exhaustive like a match binding. That is to say that we're only really looking at one case as opposed to all cases. So if for instance, we're trying to match on an enum that has like say 12 different uh, fields, uh, we're only looking at one field rather than all 12 of them. So here's an even more verbose example. We have a mutable S which has some zero inside of it. Then we open up a loop and then we have another match statement on S in which we break down I and then we say if I is greater than 19, then we want to print out quit and turn s into none. Otherwise, we want to print out the value of i, and then we want to set s equal to i plus 2. So in other words, increment the value inside of the sum by 2. If this doesn't match with sum i, we just want to break outside of the loop here. So when this gets set to none, it'll just break outside of the loop. And you can see here, here's the actual behavior. So it starts at zero, it goes two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and then it says quit and breaks the loop. Rather than writing this fairly verbose code here, we can use what's called a while let binding. So as you can see here, this is similar to our if let binding. We're saying while let, and we're saying sum of i equals s. Then we have our if statements inside of this. So basically, we've cut this down to only a few lines of code as opposed to like 17 lines of code. We're using destructuring here again, basically pattern matching s with some i. And this is only, of course, checking one case as opposed to multiple different cases. And it's not exhaustive like our match statement here is. So if I get rid of the loop and then I run this, you'll see that it has the same exact behavior as before. It goes 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, et cetera, all the way to quit and then breaks out of the loop. These structures are syntactic sugar, but they're pretty useful. So Rust provides no implicit type conversion or coercion as it's called between primitive types. Instead, there's what's called explicit conversion or casting, which can be performed with the as keyword as you see here. So as you can see here, we have a float bound to F, and then we are casting this as a U8 into I. Essentially, we're converting this from a float into a U8, and then we're putting it into I, and then we're casting I as a char and putting it into C here. As you can see here, we get our 
uh, float, and then we get an integer, and then we get this weird little character here. So with converting from an integer to a character, we need to use a u8. So this means that our integer can only be from 0 to 255. So if we put 256 in here, you can see literal out of range of u8 is the uh, warning that we get. But if we turn it into 255, it will in fact cast as a character. And you can see here that we get this weird y symbol that's used in European writing. Basically, each of the u8 numbers correspond with a character. Some of my favorites are 12 and 14. 12 gives us a female symbol and then 14 gives us this note symbol. Casting is pretty useful and we'll see it a bit more in the next tutorial and it'll give you a bit more context as to why it's fairly useful. The actual character casting is something that you'd rarely use except for in very, very specific cases though. So before we talked about the option enum, now we're going to talk about an enum called result. Now this result enum is basically usually used for error checking in Rust. You can also use the option enum to error check as well. As we saw before, you either get sum and then a value or you get none with no value. But the difference between option and result is that result will allow us to see why the function or whatever it is failed. So rather than sending back sum and then a value inside of it, we get okay and a value inside of it. And then if it fails, we get ERR and a error inside of it. And this is what the enum actually looks like. Now these are what are called generic types. Uh, basically all this really means is that the type inside of OK can be different from the type inside of error. Now here's a pretty normal example of using the result enum. So we want to read a file. I brought in this namespace here, standard fs file. We can say let f equal file open, which opens this file. This file needs to be, of course, in the root directory. Now we have this test.txt file, and we can say, okay, we'll match the file and see if we actually get the file, in which case we just return the file. Otherwise, we get an error and then we panic. And what a panic does, it will actually kick us out of the program. In this case, it will kick us out of the program with this text as well as the error that's included in the text. So if I was to run this program right now, because we actually have the file created here, it will actually open and we'll actually see nothing. But if I was to delete this file, then we will for sure get this panic here. Here's what the panic looks like. So it says thread main panicked at there was a problem opening the file, error, and then it gives us an error code and a message. So system cannot find the file specified. We can get more information by running a Rust backtrace, which is something that we'll look at a little bit more when we look into error handling. Anyway, I wanted to make you guys aware of the result enum because we will be using it in our project. Alright guys, so if you enjoyed this tutorial, feel free to subscribe and like. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you'd like. Have a good evening, guys.